to try to under, make them understand that you are enter, entering into a spiritual warfare that you'll never come out of. That's the, that's the fact that, that I, you know, so how I wanted to start this lesson is to tell you that as Christians, you are entering into an army to fight a spiritual battle that will have no end on this earth while you are here. Christ will come and eventually put an end to the warfare. But until Christ comes and puts an end to the warfare and locks Satan up forever, we will fight this thing. There is no, you know, I'm going to do a tour of duty and then I'm getting out of this. My, my tour of duty is five years is fighting spiritual warfare and then I can do whatever I want. No, it's your life. Every day for the rest of your life until Jesus comes again or you go by the grave, you are going to be a soldier fighting in this war. And Paul is letting us know that it's almost like sometimes people, when they, when they establish a church, and he was like almost telling the people in Ephesus, your church is not a cruise ship where you come for luxury and fun and games, and you have the pastor as the captain, and he has entertainment night and all that. It's not a cruise ship. It's not a showboat where, you know, it's all, you know, come and see the show. It's a battleship. Your church is a battleship, and we're the soldiers and the sailors on the battleship. Uh, fighting every day so when we get to this knowing that Jesus has told us told Nicodemus that you're going to enter to a spiritual world and Paul is telling us there's going to be a fight he gets to this last chapter and gives us instructions on what are we to do with this warfare how are we to fight it who is our enemy what are our instructions and we want to spend some time today talking about this uh, line by line verse by verse breaking it down to try to understand our role and our part. In the 10th verse of Ephesians, chapter 6, he says, Finally, my brethren, as in conclusion, after everything I've told you in the first five chapters, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the cunningness, craftiness, subtleties of the devil. I want to stop there. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Before we get to the part of putting on the armor, Paul knows that he's going to conclude this chapter by instructing people there's armor that you're going to have to put on, there's weapons that you're going to have to take up, you're going to have to do something physically, but before you do that, I want you to be strong in the Lord. You've got to prepare your mind. You've got to prepare to be a warrior, to be a fighter. You know, when, they, when you enter into the army, and most of you guys who have been in the army could come up and, and talk about you know, what they would do to you before they ever gave you the gun, before they ever show you how to shoot and send you into battle, it's a, it's a mine uh, conquest that the army wants to have for the soldier. The soldier comes in independent, you know, autonomous and able to, to make their own decisions, and it's all about independence. But when you come into the armed forces, they are wanting to train you and to, be, to make you strong in the army, understanding what your role is. You're a part of an effort, uh, you know, to, of, of fighting for what is right. And they're breaking you down so that before they give you that gun and that armor and everything that you're going to use, they have built you back up to where they need you to be so that you're strong mentally and physically. You know, a weak soldier, someone who just goes in and has never run a marathon or ever, never ran an obstacle course or never exercised, they're weak and they give, you, know, you hand them armor and things of this nature. A weak soldier with armor is still no good. You have to have a strong soldier, a strong that, a soldier who is prepared to handle the armor and to know how to use the weapon. And that's what Paul is trying to tell this church in Ephesus. I'm going to talk about your armor. I'm going to talk about your weapons, but you've got something to do first, and that's to prepare your heart, your mind, and to be strong in what you know in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Build up your faith. Build up that relationship that you have with God so that when you do put on the armor, you have the strength to use it. It's a powerful statement when we think of it, and trying to, to use the analogy of the armed forces is something that has never changed over the course of hi human history and how that, um, in, in a, no matter what time period of history, if you're going to fight for a cause, they prepare you mentally 
before they prepare you physically uh, to, to carry out this, this work that you are to do. So being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, because I want you to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I want to jump down to 13 because 13 goes along with 11. Before we get into 12, 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. In those two verses, he keeps referring to the, to the statement of standing, to stand, to stand firm. The whole purpose of fighting this we know that the evil one is coming to us. We live in an evil time and an evil day, led by an evil force. But the purpose of being a fighter, a soldier, putting on the armor, is so that we can stand and not flee. An army that flees at the first sight of the enemy is not much of an army, and it's not going anywhere. The whole instruction of being prepared is so that you can stand there and face the enemy and everything that the enemy throws at you and be able to stand with that. I listed a few things of what standing would mean in here. Standing is that we expect to be attacked. When you're a soldier, that's what you know. You're entering into warfare, and you know your job is to face the enemy and to stand there and to fight. You're expecting the attack. When you're a Christian, go ahead and expect an attack from the evil, uh, the, the enemy that you have. We have to expect that. We, so many of our young converts, if we're not careful, they may believe that once I become a Christian, then the battle is over. I've lived rough. I've done bad things. I've made bad decisions. But now that I'm a Christian, I am all, it's all going to be better. And we know better than that. We know that a lot of times that's where the war starts. The spiritual war starts. Before you're a Christian, what does the devil care about fighting you? He's already got you. That it's only when you've made that conversion and you entered into the spiritual realm of, and, and you can see the kingdom of Christ that Satan wants to go up against you. So we're expecting to be attacked. We're not going to be frightened. Standing is not being frightened to the point of running. You know, they're, they're saying that in, in the old days when the Scottish army, I always found this fascinating, maybe it's because I love the bagpipes, in the Scar Scottish army, their main weapon, you know, this, you know, Scotland, when they were fighting the English or whoever they were fighting, their main weapon was mind games. And they would go into battle. They would march from a mile away before you could ever see them, and they would play those bagpipes. And as they got closer, those bagpipes got louder. And if you're on the other opposing end, you're sitting there waiting, and you could hear that music coming. And it's getting closer and closer, and it was an unusual sound, and it struck fear into the enemy. And a lot of them would just back away when they heard that music and they knew that it was getting closer and closer, they would flee, not even seeing the enemy, just hearing it. Maybe that's why when, when you go into battle, so many soldiers yell at the top of their lungs when they go and attack, it's to strike fear. But if we're gonna stand against the wiles of the devil, we're gonna to expect to be attacked and we're not gonna be frightened away. By ever how long he, how he roars as a lion or how loud it may be, we're going to stand because we're not going to be frightened by it. We're not going to droop or slouch in a half-hearted measure. Standing means to stand erect and strong, to be balanced, and have no thought of retreat at all. It never enters your mind. To take a stand means there is no retreat. That's not the option. Taking a stand. If you're not standing, you have the, you always reserve the right to flee if you're not standing. But if you're taking a stand there, it is no option. You're going to stand and fight. So this whole idea of what Paul is trying to do is he's telling these, these people, you're going to have to prepare yourself in the Lord to be strong in him and the power of his might, getting your mind established, having that relationship with Christ to the point where you know him in a personal way, that you can stand there. You know Christ without a doubt, and I'm going to stand for him. And therefore, when I've done everything else, I can, all I can do is stand. So we go to verse 12, and we want to find out who this enemy is. Now that we know that we've got a power, of, we're, we're, we're walking in the power of the Lord's might. We're standing, we're not retreating, we're expecting the attack. Who's the attack coming from? Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not a physical man-to-man -man battle. 
that spiritually we're fighting, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities, if you look up the English definition, that basically means an area that is sovereign but governed by a prince. Some person rules and reigns over a small area. Something is drive, the driving force behind a certain thing. That's a principality governed by a prince against powers and rulers of the darkness. This is Paul saying this is a warfare but not fought hand to hand physically. You are not going to fight mankind even though mankind is a tool that the enemy uses to try to attack you. That's the key. And all the wiles of the devil, he can use other individuals to throw his fiery darts, to throw his weapons at you. But you have to realize first and foremost that this is not a battle I have with another human being. This is a battle that I have with what's controlling that human being. This is a battle I have with what's controlling the elements of this world, the rulers of this world and the spiritual world that I may not physically be able to see, but I know who's behind it. Paul is establishing who the enemy is. Because if you think that one person, one individual is your only enemy and you destroy that individual, guess what? Someone else will come along. If you have someone at your workplace that you, I'm, I'm just going to leave my workplace because I'll get rid of this battle that I have with this person. Well, Satan knows that all he has to do is throw up a person at you. He's going to find another one at your new place of employment, throw it right back at you. Know who's behind the effort of attack. Know who you're battling so that it doesn't become a battle between you and another flesh and blood person, but against the power behind that. It's important for us to know that a spiritual battle, even though he's going to talk about putting on the armor and having a sword and all of this, it gives the analogy of a hand-to-hand -hand close combat, you know, one-on-one -on -one fighting, and you're up against someone else that's coming against you. But it's important to know the difference between, even though Paul is using that analogy to kind of sink it in, he's wanting you to understand the true meaning behind the battlefield. What, what is this? Jesus will tell us that spiritual warfare is not a battle or a war physically fought or fought over brute force. It's not to overcome the other person. You know, in, war, in regular warfare, it's one army trying to overcome physically the other person by power. Spiritual warfare is warfare fought over truth. Truth is the prize that spiritual warfare is fought over. Because Christ is truth and Satan is the father of all lies and deception. We find this out, you know, when... when, when uh, Jesus is in, remember when he goes in front of Pilate, when he's getting ready to be crucified, and Pilate keeps asking him, are you a king? And Jesus tells him, you know, thou say us, or he doesn't answer at all. And then he finally set, comes around and demands a, a statement uh, of Jesus, if you're a king. And Jesus said this, and this will be, I'll, I'll try to read this quickly. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were, were of this world... Then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Pilate's referring to him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you a physical king? Is your kingdom physical here that you can fight? Are you going to revolt against the Roman Empire? Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is spiritual. If my kingdom were of this world, I'd have fighters. But my people will fight spiritually and then G then Pilate says art thou a king then and Jesus answered coming off the hills of saying my kingdom is not of this world Jesus says this thou sayest that I am a king to this end was I born or for this purpose was I born and for this cause I came into the world for what I'm about to say is the reason I came into this world that I should bear witness unto the truth that's what he's telling Pilate. The purpose for me being here is to bear witness, to let the world know of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone who wants the truth listens to me. 
Everyone who hears my voice knows the truth. That's the spiritual warfare that Jesus is saying is out there. And we know this is a battle because Pilate, wanting to get the last word, being controlled by the principalities of this world and the evil uh, d the powers of the darkness of this world, gets the last statement in and says, what is truth? You can almost depict and see and sense that Jesus is in the court there. We're surrounded by people and he's telling Pilate that my kingdom is not of this earth. I came here to show truth so that everyone that hears my voice will know truth. And the enemy comes in and says, what is truth? Sarcastically letting everyone in the house know that you can't believe what you're hearing. It goes, that, that episode goes all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden when Eve knows that she can't eat, her and Adam cannot eat of the tree of knowledge and, and good, of good and evil, Satan speaks to her in the form of a serpent. Basically, I, we don't know through scripture what he introduces her to, says, why don't you eat of this? And she says that the Lord has said, if we eat of this tree, we will die. That's truth. What does Satan do? He doesn't physically make Eve eat of the fruit. He doesn't overwhelm her physically, hand-to-hand -hand combat, open her mouth and throw a fruit into her mouth. He doesn't. He challenges the truth. You shall not surely die. Challenging the truth. Spiritual warfare began in the Garden of Eden. Truth was given. The deceiver came back and denied the truth. That's the battlefield. Trying to win what is true and what is false. What is the lie? And every day of our Christian walk, the attack upon us is to spread the lie, to challenge the truth that we know through the word of God, what God has told us to believe in and have our faith on. Satan tries to attack that truth. He did it in the garden. Pilate did it to, before Christ laid his life down, and he does it to us today. So that's who our enemy is. So let's get into what are we to do with it? How are we to prepare for this fight over truth? And in that, he says, verse 14, Stand therefore, here again standing, having your loins girt about with truth. This is a belt. And the way Paul is going to tell us how to prepare ourselves for the battle is this come in order. There's a certain way you put on your armor in sequence. The first thing you're going to do is put on this belt. Depicting a Roman soldier before they put on any of their armor, they're going to put a belt around them. And this belt was not only to give them stability, as if, if you ever uh, watch a weightlifter, before they lift a lot of weight, they put a belt to give them support on their back. And, and, and they, they tidy themselves up. Well, in the Roman days, they would use this belt not only to, to tighten themselves up, but any loose articles of clothing would be tucked into that belt so that it would tighten up. Nothing would inhibit their freedom of movement. The belt was important to tighten themselves to a point where they understood that the truth that was behind them was what was driving them. I want to talk a little bit about the belt, belt of truth because not only does the belt hold our weapon, which will come later, we don't pick up our weapon yet, we're putting on the belt, but it's also the belt is what gives us the confidence that we are ready to fight. When you tighten your belt, you're preparing to do something. When you get up in the morning, you put your pants on. If without the, without the belt, you're walking around with loose print pants. The pants could fall. It's hard to fight when you've got one hand on your, on your pants and the other hand holding the sword. You need something to gird your loins, something to tighten up. And putting on this belt is a confidence. It's an attitude of saying, I know what the truth is. And because this belt represents my attitude of being prepared, I'm going to fight because I'm preparing myself to fight. I'm tightening every, my belt to a point where I know what's coming. And I am established in the truth. I'm living in the power of the Lord's. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And the first thing, because I know my Savior, the first thing I'm going to do is prepare myself by putting on the belt. I'm going to gird up my loins. I'm going to strengthen myself because my confidence is high. Because I know the truth. Once you know the truth, you put on your belt because you know uh, what you're fighting for. Now, he goes in. Once you have the, the belt or you've girded your loins with the truth, you have the breastplate of righteousness. 
putting on the breastplate of righteousness comes after the belt, partly if you're a Roman soldier, because the breastplate of righteousness would rest upon the belt. There was a place on the belt that you could put the breastplate and it would be supported by the tight, uh, tightness of the belt. But we obviously know the reason for the breastplate. Obviously that was to protect the vital organs of the body. When you entered into warfare, the enemy was trained to know that lest to, to end our, to put to death this person that I'm attacking, I have to go after the vital organs. The breastplate of righteousness was placed, or the breastplate was placed there, it was usually either out of metal or a hard type of leather, so that very uh, few objects could ever penetrate it. This was an important part to protect the vital organs. Spiritual battle, spiritually speaking, taking the physical example of the breastplate and moving into the spiritual realm, the enemy knows that when he can attack your righteousness, he, can, he is trying to attack your character, your integrity, your decisions to live a holy life. If he can break you down into believing that <clears throat> you can't do this, if he can attack your character as a, as a Christian and get you to believe that you can't live a righteous life, you just can't battle this flesh that you have. If he can convince that, then those attacks on your heart can def defeat you. It can destroy you. Paul is wanting you to know that he is, he's using the breastplate with the term righteousness because it is not your righteousness that is hanging over your vital organs that's protecting you. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is hanging over your organs when the enemy comes after you saying look who you think you are when the enemy says i know what you're thinking and i saw what you did i heard what you said to that individual in a, in a fit of anger and you're going to try to tell me that you're righteous that's a dagger right to the heart breaking you down we have to understand that the shield or the the breastplate of righteousness that covers our vital organs is nothing we have done it is what Christ did. When he died on the cross, the Lord only sees, when he sees us, and we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, he sees the righteousness of Christ rather than us. Remember the story where Joshua, the high priest, is standing before God and Satan is standing there accusing him, accusing the high priest of being filthy. He's there with these filthy rags. Satan is accusing him of not being a righteous person. And the Lord remarks and says, take off these rags and bring a robe of righteousness and put on Joshua. That's what he sees every time he sees us. When we're in battle for the Lord, where the enemy is trying to attack our righteousness, we understand through truth that it's not righteousness that we place there. We're protected by the righteousness of Christ. Don't accuse me to the point of breaking me and defeating me because I am under the righteousness of of Jesus Christ and that's the, the, the power of that breastplate that is, is so, so vital for our, our well-being. Now he goes from girding up our loins with truth, protecting our vital organs with the breastplate of the, of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to now going into what we put around our feet. And your feet shod or secured with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He wants us to do something in, with our feet. Feet are preparing for battle. If you, you can put all the armor on that you want, but if your feet don't move, you're no use to in the army. If you're not walking forward, if you're not obeying the commands, your feet obey the commands. If you're just not going to use your feet at all, you're useless to the army. And so being in the Roman days, they, they had a special type of sandal, from what I've learned, some of them would even drive types of nails through the, the sandals to be uh, used uh, kind of like a, a cleat in a sporting event. If you're a football, baseball player, you have a cleat that grabs the earth. A lot of these Roman soldiers had something form of that because they needed to maintain their balance. And any obstacle that came into the way of the formation of the march, anything, a, a sharp stone or a thorny bush or a cactus or anything that they were there, their sandals were, were around their ankles and shins to protect them 
from the obstacles and to keep their balance and most importantly to keep them going forward because the preparation is I'm preparing myself that as I go forward I don't know what I'm going to run into that's the beauty of the word preparation for Paul using when he talks about the feet when you're facing the enemy you don't always know what you're walking on so you're prepared the type of shoe is going to be prepared for everything that I may encounter along the way spiritual battlefield when he says have your feet shod um, you know, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace knowing what the good news knowing what the word of God says prepares us for whatever situation may we may come against or may come up to when Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan he didn't know what or how Satan would would approach him and with what what type of an attack he knew the attack was coming he knew that his battle was there in the wilderness, and he, he knew who his enemy was, but he wasn't sure. We don't know until Satan actually appears and in three attempts tries to bring Jesus down, challenging, here again, truth. Everything that Satan tried to do in, with Jesus in the wilderness was challenging the truth. You know, the Bible says if you cast down, your angels will keep you protect you so you don't dash your foot against a stone the bible says you know that you know you you know if you're the son of god turn these stones into bread because you're you're hungered everything he did was challenging the truth of the word and jesus may not have known the angle that he was coming but he was so prepared for it that he knew the scriptures that he would fight the satan fight satan with he knew how to fight the unexpected the obstacle that was thrown in front of him he was prepared with the gospel of peace the gospel of peace paul is also saying here is that we are arm in our in our warfare we have to be prepared that no matter what the obstacle comes we don't when we when we fight uh, the enemy if they're using human beings or circumstances on the earth we have to be careful in how we react in our warfare so that we don't we still continue to use the gospel of peace we are to be peacemakers paul's telling us we're going to be fighters jesus says blessed are the peacemakers you can do both i'm reading a book now about how the spanish conquistadors actually over um, you know conquered the southwestern part of the u.s you know back in the 1500s before the pilgrims ever landed the spaniards were already in southwest america uh, dealing with the the natives there and they brought to the natives, they wanted to bring their, their religious faith of Christianity. And they came and they would bring in their, what they called their friars, which were Catholic priests. And they would preach to the Indian nations, wanting them to be converted to Christianity. This was the battlefield for them, as they wanted to win converts. They knew that Christ had given the Great Commission, go out into the world. Preach the gospel, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Do all these things, and they're doing it. The problem with, with them at times is if the converts did not accept religion, the, the faith, or if they did and then retracted, or as in some cases they would find where the Indians would accept the faith, but then they would revert back to their um, certain areas of pagan worship, and they would find out about it, the conquistadors would simply just kill them. You became a follower of Christ, willingly or unwillingly, you were going to either by the point of the sword or by your acceptance. We're to spread the gospel of peace and know that when the attacks come or when, when our battle is there, we're still, we're prepared for whatever may come, but we're always prepared to do it in a peaceful way. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Taking the shield of faith. Now, up to this point, we've put on things. We've prepared ourselves. We've put on our belt of truth. We've put on our breastplate of Jesus' righteousness. We've prepared our feet against any unforeseen obstacle that may come our way knowing that we're going to handle this obstacle in a peaceful way. But now we're taking up something to protect us when needed. 
This is a shield that you don't wear. You just take it when the battle comes. When the battle, when, it's, when, it's, when you're preparing to, for battle and you see the enemy, you take up your shield because the shield is prepared to um, break the fiery darts or quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Here again, in the Roman days, when Roman soldiers were, were marching and they were usually ambushed by what they considered barbarian tribes, part of the ambush would, would be to use a volley, sometimes of hundreds of arrows, coming through the air at one time into the legion or into the regiment of the Roman soldiers that were marching because in multitudes of arrows coming down, surely you're going to take out most of these people, get hit by these arrows. But the way the Romans had devised this long shield, it could cover them basically from head to foot when they knelt down by it, and the ones behind them in the column could raise them up over the tops of their heads, and you would form a turtle shell. So that when all these, fi fi these, these darts and arrows would come in, it would just ping into all these, sh the, these shields and not hurt the men underneath the shields. The people attacking the Roman soldiers would eventually light the end of these arrows, put them on fire so that when they came and stuck into the shields, you had fire on the end of the shields, hoping to frighten the Roman soldiers to drop their shield. No one likes a burning shield, so let's drop this thing. What Paul is saying is no matter what the devil tries to do, when he fires his fiery darts in the battlefield at you, pick up this shield of faith because your faith is what's going to quench the fire out of these darts. The power behind the darts. The power, your shield was blocking the darts, but the darts were now were on fire. But they can be quenched by your faith. Everything that you've been preparing for is built around what you know to be the truth. The gospel of Christ is truth, therefore my faith is strong. And I will use this shield because that shield represents my faith. No matter what you throw at me. You will not defeat my faith. You will not destroy me because my faith is that strong and I have faith in my shield. I will take it always in battle. I will never leave my shield behind because without my shield, I am open and vulnerable. Even with the breastplate of righteousness, there are parts of my body that is still vulnerable. But with my shield of faith, you cannot conquer me in battle. And take the helmet of salvation putting on a helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation is going to cover another vital part of your body. We know, obviously, if you're fighting physically hand to hand, the helmet is to protect your, your, your head, which if your head is wounded, it could be mortal, uh, a mortal wound there. We want to protect that. But in this case, Paul is saying your helmet that you're going to wear in this spiritual war is the helmet of salvation because salvation is our hope. He refers throughout his letters to different churches. When he mentions salvation, he usually will combine the words hope and or salvation of hope or the hope of our salvation. You know, Peter will even tell us, always prepared to give an answer for the hope of your salvation. Salvation is our Christians, our hope, because our hope is that we fight this battle until either the rapture or until we die and we have eternal life awaiting us. The hope of our salvation is that the blood of Jesus has covered all of our sins. Therefore, we will not spend eternity in hell. We will spend eternity in heaven with our Lord and Savior. That is a hope that drives and sustains us. The enemy tries to destroy that hope through discouragement. Just like the breastplate of righteousness when he attacks your vital organs to say that you're not righteous. Look at, look at the decision you've made. Look at what you said. Look at what you did, and you're claiming to be right. That, that shield's not, that breastplate's not going to protect you at all. He does the same thing to the vital organ of your brain, of your head. He tries to discourage. If you have a hope uh, of salvation in your mind, you are there. That is to give you encouragement in the line of battle. I am encouraged because of my salvation, even though the enemy will try to discourage me to say, to battle the truth, saying that the truth is a lie. There is no eternity. There is no heaven. You're living this lifestyle for nothing to try to discourage you in the fight. But my salvation is my encouragement. My salvation tells me that I have an, an eternity waiting on me. And therefore, I will continue in this battle for the rest of my life. 
We need motivation. We need encouragement. And our salvation is our encouragement. Protect that encouragement. Don't let the enemy, don't uncover your head when you go into battle because he's going to see it uncovered and he's going to go straight for the salvation, the hope of salvation to discourage us. And a, and a soldier that is discouraged usually will say to himself, what's the use? What am I fighting for? Now, a soldier who has gotten to the point where he says, I don't know why I'm even fighting, what's the use of this? That's a defeated soldier at that point. His whole regiment is in trouble. If, if that starts spreading, what's the use of fighting? Our hope of salvation continues to encourage us daily to say, my hope is in the Lord, my hope is in eternity, even so come Lord Jesus today, that is our hope of salvation because in the end, that's what makes us fight this daily fight every day to ward off the darts and the attacks of the enemy. My time is up. I knew it would be. Um, a powerful lesson, something that we need to pay attention to because we never want to leave the fact or leave the knowledge that every day it is a battle and each of us have a different battle. He attacks us differently according to our circumstances, where we are in this world, our personality. He learns us just like we learn of him. He knows what makes us move and what upsets us and discourages us. So it's a daily battle, but look at the tools that we have. Take, incur take courage over the fact that we've got the armor of the Lord. If we utilize it, if we do what Paul says and put it on daily, we can win this thing. We are the victors. That's the, the greatest encouragement is we've, Christ has already won the war. We just have to battle it every day to get to the day when Christ finally puts the enemy away forever. It's a daily grind, a daily fight. Don't lose the fact of this chapter of Ephesians. Read it. Uh, study it. It will encourage you to know that as we battle Satan, we can win this thing. He will not conquer us unless we go in unprepared. Next week, we start the winter quarter with the book of Luke. We're going to be timely, given the Luke gives us the most detailed uh, understanding of the birth of Christ. But next week, we're going to start several uh, uh, discussion points on the book of Luke. So I look forward to breaking that open and bringing it to you. And we'll see you then. Have a good week.